All right, Jesse, last week's fatal family vacation was truly tragic. What's the story this week? Today, I will be telling you a ye old murder that launched my fascination with true crime. The story of the first frontier serial killing family, the Bloody Benders. Oh my God, yes. I'm Andy Cazette. And I'm Jesse Prey, and this is Love Murder. Hi, Andy. Hi, Jesse. Welcome back, everyone, to Love Murder, a podcast about quirks, jerks, and love gone fatally wrong. You can find Love Murder on TikTok and Instagram at Love Murder Pod and on Facebook by searching Love Murder Podcast. If you enjoy this show, please love slash murder a five star rating on your podcast app. Subscribe and review to help new people discover the show. As always, we super duper appreciate your kind words. Also, if you are interested in supporting the show more directly, head on over to patreon.com slash lovemurderpod, where you can learn all about the different tiers of support and all of the goodies that you get. Speaking of Patreon, we're so excited, as always, this week to welcome and shout out a new set of wonderful patrons. Welcome to Barbara M. and Jessica T., Stacy H. and Adriana M., Lisa L. and Sarah B., Kelsey B. and Jennifer T., and finally, Annie C. Yeah, we saw some like familiar names of the patrons, this grouping. I feel like we've talked to some of you guys on social media before, so thanks for joining us. Also, I'm psyched to say we did have some interest in the Love Murder Book Club idea. Right now, Andy and I are both racing to get some episodes out in double time, essentially, because she will be in Europe. I will be joining her for at least one week of that tour. So we are making sure that we record ahead, just like we did with our maternity episodes, so that you guys don't miss a week while we are enjoying a summer break. Yeah, a un petit summer break, family vacation. Uh, Yeah, you're working the whole time. (laughs) I'm going to have a summer break after I get these episodes done. We also just recorded in order to get ahead my June Patreon, and we had so much fun with it last night. So we will be issuing two Patreon bonuses every month now moving forward. We started that kind of at the beginning of the year, right, Jess? Yes. And it's a banger. I loved Andy's. Andy, do you want to tell them what it is? Yeah. It was all about Japanese ghost stories, which are called Kaidan. And we had so much fun. We recorded it last night. Yes. So I just want to manage expectations and let you guys know that I will be looking into the book club situation at the end of June. So we would not be launching until earliest July. So look for book club in July and we will keep you posted when it becomes a reality. I think people are going to be really excited about that. I'm very excited about it, but I'm also excited about today's episode. So this is the story that got me into true crime. I cannot believe it. Yeah, I feel like my true crime slippery slope actually started in libraries. I grew up in a rural area that had no real television situation. It was like two channels that I got. So I didn't get like the whole like unsolved mysteries or America's Most Wanted until much later. So it was like Nancy Drew, Hardy Boys, Harriet the Spy into Mary Higgins Clark mysteries until eventually I got to some book that was like Dark Histories of America or something like it was like I can't even remember who the author was. It was a pretty pulp book, but it featured the story of the frontier serial killing family, the Bloody Benders. And I was hooked. I always wanted to know more information. And I found an incredible new book, which I will talk about a little bit later. But I think without further ado, I want to just launch into this episode, Andy. Please. I'm very excited. Alexander York was not the type of man who gave up easily. He had commanded a regiment as a lieutenant colonel in the Union Army during the Civil War. And he had served as a Kansas state senator, weathering scandal and political opposition. York had stood to reveal corruption at the highest levels of the U.S. government, even if it meant ending his own political career, which it did. No matter the consequences, he did the right thing, and he followed through. But when the matter was blood, when it was family gone missing, Alexander's York will was even more resolute. 
His brother, Dr. William York, had gone missing somewhere on the Osage Mission Trail in Labette County, Kansas, in March of 1873. The trail was in frequent use due to the expanding communities exploding because of westward expansion and the fact that it was seemingly a more safe trail by frontier standards. No mountains, no deep canyons, but there was a nice winding river to provide water. But still, calamity lurked around every corner. Flash floods, lightning strikes, temperature plunging without warning into freezing. And now there was another terror haunting this area of Labette County. Men had been disappearing. Body parts were found in riverbeds. Heartbroken wives riding stagecoaches from Independence to Lador begging strangers for any information about their missing husbands. Alexander's brother was one of these men, but he had actually been doing what Alexander was now doing. William's neighbor and 18-month-old daughter of that neighbor had disappeared from this very location. And William had vowed to bring the killer or killers to justice. A fiery passion ran through the York blood. William had been determined to get to the bottom of what was happening and staunch the tide of pain, heartbreak, and fatherless children that were left in this nightmare's wake. But then he too disappeared. In April of 1873, York arrived in Osage Township to interview the people who lived and worked the land. A local detective and those who had also lost a loved one were eager to greet him. There were rumors and accusations, stories of occult practices, of unnatural family relationships, and firsthand accounts of experiences that ran the gamut from petty theft and fraud to something more menacing and dark. All of these stories revolved around one family, the Benders. The Benders, I mean, that name even in and of itself is like... If it was really their real name. Oh. We don't know. Is this one of those, if they were real people? Oh, no, these <laughs> were definitely real people. But we don't know what their real identities were, okay. truly. And were they actually a family? That's what we're going to talk about today. So Ma and Pa Bender were estimated to be in their 50s and 60s, respectively. They seemingly spoke no English or very, very little English, only German, though no one knew if they'd come straight from Germany or if they were a Pennsylvania Dutch community that had basically landed first there and then immigrated west. They lived in a cabin with Ma's daughter, Kate, and their son or son-in-law, John Gephardt, also known as John Bender Jr. It was hard to say. John and Kate were said to be siblings, but they acted more like lovers. Oh, weird. <laughs> yes, that was certainly reason enough to raise eyebrows, but there was so much more. Unproven robbery charges, tales of aggressive and menacing behavior, and beautiful, beguiling Kate at the center of it all, advertising her services as a spiritualist to connect desperate people to their loved one's past and claiming to be able to heal all sorts of diseases like blindness, fits, deaf, and dumbness. In the very least, they were some unsavory characters, that's for sure. And at the worst, cold-blooded murderers. York took a little stock of the local rumor mill, but agreed to ride out and meet the benders at their homestead. He planned to be pretty secretive about this. He wanted to ask Kate for her help finding his brother kind of innocently by saying, I saw your ads for being a spiritualist and being able to speak to the dead. And my brother went missing in this area. So I was hoping you could use your professional skills to tell me whether he was dead or alive. Okay. Rather than being straight up aggressive, like my brother was here. Did you kill him? Also, if you're a real spiritualist, you should be able to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's what he thought. So there was a couple men who accompanied York to this cabin, and the cabin was not a good place. It was pretty gross. It was a downtrodden affair, which advertised groceries with a misspelled sign. How did they spell it? It was like G-R-O-C-R-Y, like grocery. Grocery. Yeah. It was missing an E, I think. Some livestock lingered in pens, but they weren't very well kept. And York noticed that the cabin was in very poor shape, 
but the orchard that surrounded it was well kept. The topsoil recently raked and looking fresh and turned over. Mmm. <laughs> Foreshadowing. <laughs> Young John was said to be around 25 or so, and he was reading a German Bible when the men approached. He spoke English with an accent. He introduced himself, and then the men trudged into the small, claustrophobic space, a musty scent lingering in the spring air. Ooh. So Kate came behind this curtain. I'm going to get a little bit more in detail of how this whole cabin is laid out in a little bit. But suffice to say that the front area of the cabin, which was really one room, but it was bisected by this canvas curtain, the front was for visitors and the back was for the vendors, private quarters and sleeping area. So Kate came around this kind of like greasy, soiled canvas. Chic. (laughs) This is frontier chic. (laughs) To greet them. And she was as pleasing to the eye as had been told. She had auburn hair, flashing eyes, high cheekbones, and a wide, confident smile that served her well. There was a small scar under one of her eyes that only added intrigue and enhanced her appeal. So it was easy to see why, despite how gross this cabin is, that the Bender cabin had become a popular place to stop by when you were traveling the Osage Trail especially with the male travelers. (laughs) Alexander York introduced himself, and he told Kate that his brother, Dr. William York, had gone missing. So he was hoping that she could give him some information through her professional medium ways. Just don't ask her to spell something for you. (laughs) So the other guy was watching her, and this all comes from archival, like, newspaper accounts and true life accounts at the time that the author, Suzanne Jonasis, collected. So the other guy said that when he asked this question, a shadow passed over Kate's fair features that she like kind of narrowed her eyes for a second, but then immediately like had a bright smile on her face once more. So it was just a quick moment of dropping the mask. And she told Alexander that that was far too big of a mystery to solve on the spot. And I guess the two other guys that were with him basically were saying, see, I told you it's a whole pile of bullshit. And at that, Ma Bender, who was described as, like, really surly and constantly scowling and had been previously, like, resting in a rocking chair, all of a sudden flew into a fit of convulsions and cursing. And both John and Kate ran to aid the older woman. And then John told the men that he had actually been shot near where a body had been found around Christmas. So he's like, look, I don't know anything about your brother, but... There was a guy who was, who was killed over there. He was found over there in that same place I was shot at. So maybe there's some answers about where your brother went over there. And Alexander already thought, like, this whole place was weird. He was like, I don't know what's going on here. The vibe is off. I don't know if they're killers per se, but they're definitely eccentric. And I don't know if I'm going to find anything of value out here. So he agreed to go with John to see this place where he had been shot. And as he was leaving... Kate placed a hand on his arm and said with innocent wide eyes, if you come back in an evening next week without your men, I will have an answer to your question. Gonna lure him back to that cabin all alone. Well, answers would soon be forthcoming, but not due to Kate's psychic powers. The dead would soon be unearthed and their bodies would speak of horrible cruelty and atrocities previously considered inconceivable. A horror phenomenon that did not yet have a name, the Benders became America's first family of serial killers. And like I said, they were my first fascination with true crime. They were before Jack the Ripper, before H.H. Holmes, before Belle Gunnis. Before all of those famous serial killers, there was the Benders, who killed somewhere between 11 and 20 people during their reign of terror. Wow. But little is known about who they actually were. What, besides money, was their motive? Who was actually doing the murdering out of the four of them? And where they went? Because they just might have gotten away with it, Andy. Wow. It's a real yield murder mystery up in here today. 
if you guys are regular listeners of the podcast, you know we're not a serial killer podcast. And Andy, like I just hinted at, I'm sorry to say there isn't some satisfyingly justice delivering conclusion. So therefore, it's kind of an odd fit for love murder. But I think even more than true crime, I think our show is about human dynamics. Yes. What are the ties that bind, I guess, and maybe torture and kill? And there's no greater complicated dynamic than that of a family. Yeah, absolutely. Like, who knows? Like you mentioned earlier, like they could be a quote unquote family. Exactly. Of a bunch of loners. We're going to talk about how they potentially were related or not related. And then you like add in the insane world of the frontier and the post-Civil War era. It's a sprinkling of serial killering and you have officially piqued my interest and hopefully (laughs) y'all's. Well, this episode would not be possible without the groundbreaking new book, Hell's Half Acre, The Untold Story of the Benders, A Serial Killer Family on the American Frontier by Suzanne Jonasus. Apologies to Suzanne if I am pronouncing her last name wrong. She did so much work. I guess she started this book while getting her master's in, I think it was King's College London. And then she also went to University of St. Andrews. So cool. So she's very, very wickedly smart. And she did a a master's on, essentially, I think it was the intersection between crime and technology in the 19th century. Wow. Which is such a neat master's. And this book was born of some of her research that started then. And it became a passion. She even went out and she lived in Kansas for a little while. She went to all the spots. She went to all the libraries. She dug up all of the archives and went through everything basically trying to be a historical detective. So cool. Yeah, it's really neat. And I think that there was definitely a hope that she could find out exactly what happened to the Benders through this forensic research that she was doing so much later than when these atrocities occurred. And there's there's a lot of detail. So we'll get into exactly what she found and what she found out about the Benders But big thank you to that author. And I also listened to an audible by Harold Schechter, who is another very famous true crime writer. We don't like often use because he mostly covers serial killers, but he named his short book on the benders Little Slaughterhouse on the Prairie, which I thought was great. It's amazing. I know. I was like, oh, I wonder if I can steal that for our title. (laughs) So if I do, thanks to Harold Schechter. But yeah, this has already been a very long intro, so let's start by trying to parse through who the Benders are, if they were related like you asked, Andy, and what the hell was going on with them. So Pa Bender and John Gephardt arrived first in Osage Township in October of 1870 to make a claim on the land. And I'm going to keep the American history as brief as possible for this episode, but the 1862 Homestead Act offered 160 acres of land to whomever could prove that they had worked on and improved land that was still available over a five-year period. Wild. It was a tool for westward expansion, but also a handy-dandy way to displace Native Americans because, of course, this land was not just free and available with nobody living on it. (laughs) So Pa and John showed up and Pa was not making any friends. He was glowering, hulking, and distinctly unfriendly. Many accounts said that there was something like, like he moved like a gorilla. It was like hunched and hulking and big and frowning constantly. Okay. He hardly spoke. And when he did, it was in really guttural German. John, on the other hand, never shut up. Though he is described as relatively good looking, albeit with two close together eyes, he had a very odd energy that unnerved people. Every account discussed how he would just randomly start laughing about nothing, it seemed like, out of the blue. So like you'd be spending time with him and all of a sudden he'd be like, ha 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 ha, just really creepy. And he was like prone to these like bizarre ramblings, like almost to like just fill the air. He's obviously, if he's not talking out loud, he's talking in his head a lot at himself. Yeah. So people thought there might be something mentally wrong with him. The two men picked up a claim that was very close to the Osage Trail, 
but still managed to be kind of hidden in a valley so that their neighbors would be unable to see them. There wasn't really another roadhouse that would provide food or shelter to travelers for miles. This was a great destination for them to build the crude cabin that would ultimately serve as a slaughterhouse for innocent travelers. Ma and Kate soon joined the men. Ma was as dour as her husband and also spoke little to no English. It was suggested, however, that she actually understood English very well and perhaps spoke it okay as well. But she pretended not to so people would speak openly in English around her and think that she didn't understand so that she could glean knowledge from these conversations. Trickster. Yeah. So again, we do not know about the real relationships between these people, even though everyone commonly assumes they are a family, because no records exist that actually prove these people were related either by blood or marriage. Now, based on... The books that I read, this has also been featured in so many podcasts. I think a few years ago, I saw like an evil kin on Investigation Discovery about this as well. It seems like everyone collectively believes that Ma really was Kate's mother. Okay. That for some reason, they think that's a connection. And they do mostly believe that Ma was married to Pa, but it seems like she had been married quite a few times in her life. Really? Yeah. So likely Pa is not the father of Kate. There's like other sources. So like I checked out the Wikipedia page, but it had so many, I don't know if they were inaccuracies, but I would guess that they are based on how well-researched Suzanne Jonas's book was, where they differed. So I tried not to go off of the Wikipedia, but the Wikipedia suggested that her name was Elvira and that she had been married like seven or eight times or something before this. Whoa. But Suzanne Jonas's did not get into the specifics because I do not know if that has ever been proven. So then there's John, John Gephardt, who is also known as John Bender Jr. And when Pa and John showed up first, everyone assumed they were related and they just did not tell anyone otherwise. So they were assumed to be father and son when they showed up. And then all of a sudden, Ma and Kate show up and they're very clearly mother and daughter. And the parents are married. So everyone's like, okay, so they must be siblings. So... Then when Kate and John seemed a little too intimate for everyone's taste, everyone was like, well, were we wrong? Is it actually more of a son-in-law situation? And we don't know. But it seems like on purpose, the Benders never, ever told anyone and never corrected anyone when they assumed a situation. Yeah, creepy. That's the sound of another sale on Shopify and the moment another business stream becomes a reality. What a glorious sound. It's the best. Shopify is the commerce platform pretty much revolutionizing millions of businesses worldwide. Whether you're selling boutique vintage clothing finds, handcrafted home decor, hopefully some true crime podcast merch, (laughs) Shopify simplifies selling online and in person so you can focus on successfully growing your business. Shopify covers every sales channel from an in-person POS system to an all-in-one e-commerce platform. It even lets you sell across social media marketplaces like TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram. Packed with industry-leading tools ready to ignite your growth, Shopify gives you complete control over your business and your brand without having to learn any new skills in design or code. And thanks to 24-7 help and an extensive business course library, Shopify is there to support your success every step of the way. Jesse, I cannot tell you how much Shopify means to our team. As a small business owner for nearly 10 years, Shopify provides me with all of the tools necessary to act like a big business. When you start your own company, there are so many hoops to jump through. How am I going to manage orders? How am I going to ship orders? Will I even have any orders? Yeah, yeah. Kind of need customers to have a store, right? (laughs) The whole thing is so, so overwhelming to the point to where I think so many people end up just not doing it. But if you can get a website going and you can figure out how to navigate Shopify, you can do it. Shopify makes everything so easy. And the website design is just one of the many areas that Shopify shines. You can pick from hundreds of templates and easily navigate how to customize it to make it your own special store. Also, one of my other favorite features, you know, because I'm such a numbers nerd, are the super easy to read reports, which make quarterly tax payments a piece of cake. That's so awesome to hear. And now for you guys, our wonderful listeners. 
It's your turn to get serious about selling and try Shopify today. This is Possibility powered by Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash lovemurder, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash lovemurder to take your business to the next level today. Shopify.com slash lovemurder. It's possible that, yeah, maybe they weren't a real biological or married family, but perhaps they were just a crime family. Maybe it was easier to model themselves after a nuclear family to get away with their grifts and their cons. Absolutely. People would feel so much safer going and stopping by for grocery. <laughs> grocery. <laughs> if you knew it was a nice frontier family, I mean, they're only... A little while down the road from Laura Ingalls Wilder in yeah. Little House on the Prairie. So you're hoping you're going to get the Ingalls and instead you get the Benders. Jesus Christ. So who knows? They might have just been acting like a family altogether. An article from 1903 by D.R. Miller claimed that Kate was extremely outspoken about spiritualism, a religious social movement in the 19th century that believed essentially ghosts are real and can be contacted by the living and why it was a social movement is because actually there was some good that came out of spiritualism insofar as a lot of people who were channeling the dead were spreading messages about how there should not be slavery and how women should get the right to vote. And so it was like, it was like some progressive ghosts, basically. <laughs> so another component of spiritualism in some parts of the world, I guess, was free love, which is essentially like trying to take the legal bit out of who you can love and when you can love. And Kate interpreted that to being able to have sex with her brother. It's like Andy was about to say, yeah, that's a great idea. And then she just stopped. I watched her go, nope. It's not all free love, Kate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You can't sleep with your brother. She was quoted as saying, shall we confine ourselves to a single love and deny our natures their proper swing, even though it may be a brother's passion for his own sister? I say it should not be smothered. Oh, so they're actually talking about it. According to this article from 1903. Oh, it has to be accurate then. <laughs> yes. Yeah, Susan Jonas points out in her book how getting to the truth of what happened about the vendors is very hard because you got all sorts of people writing all sorts of things. All of these little witnesses coming out of the woodwork saying, well, I talked to her once and she said this. So we don't know. People exaggerate. People lie. So we don't know if she actually said that, but it was attributed to her. I can't say if murder was always the plan, but the Benders were certainly looking to take advantage of vulnerable homesteaders because she was setting up this spiritualism business. And Kate was certainly not flying under the radar. This is like a not a great look if you're going to be a serial killer to be out there taking advantage of people who are grieving, spreading advertisements around for your spiritualism services, and openly talking about how you're banging your brother is not flying under the radar. Kate advertised her medium skills, and she also openly discussed her belief in free love. So it seemed like Kate was very manipulative, and she was a con artist who was playing all sides. She would prey on the sick and grieving by claiming to spiritually be able to heal what ails them and then also contact their loved ones. Well, the young men who might not be the target audience of her psychic abilities would become frequent visitors to the cabin hoping to get a little piece of that free love. Yeah. Because they're like, well, she's talking about it. Maybe she's giving some out. It's the frontier. I'm getting lonely. Was it free though? I do not think so. And now there's rumors that she worked as a sex worker, but or she had worked as a sex worker before yeah. she came to Labette County. So it was just an add-on. Yeah, but we do not know. Okay. But while Kate was attractive, a little wild and enigmatic, John Jr. was unsettling and the elder benders were downright scary. So now I'm going to get into how the cabin looked in 1872 and 1873. The cabin was one room, but divided by a heavy wagon canvas that was infamously stained with God knows what. And we'll talk about that later. Behind the curtain was the private quarters where they had like a little like straw mattress and stuff where the whole family slept. Okay. They offered a little storefront in the front of the cabin, but they said that they're often wasn't a lot stocked there. So it was a paltry offering. 
And then there was a table that was made out of walnut. And then there was two benches on either side for guests to sit. And guests, I suppose, were always offered the bench that was like basically their head would be to the curtain. The curtains behind them. It's not very comfortable. Yeah. And speaking of not very comfortable, usually guests in the summer and the nice weather would sleep outside. Even though they stopped here to get some food and to stay the night, they would sleep outside of the cabin. And then in the winter, they would sleep on the floor, basically like propped up on their belongings in the front area while the Bender slept in the back. Despite being in the hospitality business, the Benders did not keep a clean house. It was described as being in squalor. Dirty utensils and cookware, filth in the cabin, a pervasive bad smell, and lots and lots of thick black flies everywhere. Oh, you know why flies are around. Yeah, we know why the flies are around, and we also know why guests might want to sleep outside after stepping a foot into this place. Yeah, then it's not really a place to rest. No, but it was a place where they could get fire like warmth, especially if they're traveling. They could get a little food if they were desperate. You have to be a real desperado. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty It's pretty bad. Well, in the winter months, I think Susan even wrote about how a lot of times people would not be prepared for the cold when it came or that all of a sudden temperatures would drop really quickly after they had been mild for a long time. And people would have fully frostbitten feet and fingers by the time they reached the bender. So it was just like any, any warmth, any port in the storm at that point. The benders started causing trouble only weeks after their arrival when they stole some $32,000 of traveler's checks in today's money from a family staying with them, claiming that horse thieves had raided the cabin while they were out. Oh. As they essentially did this thing, these like two women were traveling and they had put their money in the Bender's safe for safekeeping as guests of their hotel. And then Kate had suggested that they go out and look for arrowheads and other Native American artifacts. And they had spent a pleasant day doing that, except for Ma and Pa had gone out with them. And then Ma pretended to have this convulsive fit. Oh, so she does this often. Yes, she does. And... Pa decided to take her back to the cabin. And then when the whole group got back, so it's like John and Kate and the two women, they got back. Ma and Pa were like, we don't know what happened when we got home. It looks like our cabin was raided by horse thieves and they took all your stuff. That sucks. They were like, excuse me. No. And I guess the husband of one of the women like worked in the township and was like, hello, you need to give them back all their stuff. And they were like, we don't have it. It was horse thieves. And so they couldn't prove it, though. So there was some rumor about it, but no one could ever prove it. So they were never charged with anything. And the Benders learned an important lesson from that, too, because there was a lot of heat on them, even though they wiggled out of it, which was next time we steal from somebody. Got to kill them. Yeah. Maybe we won't leave them alive. Yeah. All of that is going to spread like wildfire. All of that goss. It's a hot tea. They were not just terrorizing their borders. A woman who was one of Kate's spiritual clients also reported back a terrifying tale. In the late spring of 1871, a hotel worker named Julia Hessler befriended Kate when Kate was working as a waitress at the same place. So Kate sounds busy because it's like Kate planted a garden and an orchard and she has a spiritual business and she's thieving and she's potentially killing and now she's also working at a hotel. (laughs) Yeah, she's hustling. She's a revolutionary woman. She's a frontier hashtag lady boss. So yeah, so they're working in this hotel together. And Kate told her all about spiritualism and her talents as a medium. And this was something that Julia was very interested in. And they had actually done just like a couple seances together at the hotel after hours, just the two of them. And everything seemed above board. It seemed like Kate definitely had some sort of skill, even if it was just theatrical. So when she told Julia that there was actually a circle of women who were involved in all of this and that she could come over and have a seance with the whole circle, Julia was like really into it. So (laughs) she took a stagecoach out and planned to stay at the Bender's cabin for the night. 
and be inducted into this cool society of a spiritualist woman and do this crazy seance. But to her disappointment and disconcertment, I would say, there was no one there except for Kate when she arrived. Oh. So she's like, oh, I thought it was going to be like a whole society, a whole group of us. And she's like, oh, no, you know, they weren't really like true believers. It's actually much better when it's just two people because when somebody doesn't truly believe, then the spirits won't come. So this is much better. By now it's dark. She has no way home because the stagecoach that she took essentially acted like a taxi service or like a bus. And so it's gone. And the benders are not there. It's just Kate. So she doesn't know where the rest of the family is, even though it's dark. And Kate lit only one single candle. So you can imagine how dark it is on the frontier in the pitch black. And there's just one candle in the entire place. It's creepy. It's dirty. Julia later reported that there was an unpleasant smell lingering in the back of her throat that was making her feel ill. Oh, but she didn't want to insult Kate because this was her home. So she didn't want to say like, God, what's that smell? So she's just trying to choke it back. And she said that Kate gestured for where she should sit, which was at the table with her back to the greasy curtain. And then they started talking about what spirits they wanted to reach. But Julia said that she was having a hard time concentrating because there were so many flies in the cabin. Oh, Ugh, I know. It's so gross. So they're buzzing all over. They're like in her ear. Honestly, I can't even imagine like we had something dead in our wall at the office a couple of years ago. I don't know if I ever told you. I don't think you did. It was either like a little, little mouse or a city rat or whatever, but like it got somehow in the walls and died and decayed and the flies that came from that. Yeah, it's so different. It's So the corpse flies are very big. They're like these gigantic juicy, big black flies. They're huge. They're like almost half an inch or an inch big. And so we got one, that electric fly swatter I bought Nathaniel and we had to use that. <laughs> yes. When they hit it, they were like, it was like a big bug. But like that's from like a little rodent in the wall. Like imagine it being if it's like a bigger animal or a human, like the fly situation has to be unbelievable. It was. And they certainly seemed that big because she talked about in her account that she tried to close her eyes and hold Kate's hands to start doing the seance when she was distracted by a fly loudly hitting the curtain. Like that's how big they are, that it created a thud sound when it hit the curtain. And so she said when the fly hit the curtain, she opened her eyes because it was like a weird noise behind her. And when she opened her eyes, she said that she all of a sudden saw that Ma, Pa, and John had crept into the cabin at some point and were standing, like, behind or next to Kate. So Kate doesn't move. She doesn't, like, offer any, oh, like, my parents are here. She doesn't say anything. So Julia's like, I have to go relieve myself, which obviously you go outside for. And she said that as she tried to walk by Kate to get to the exit, Kate grabbed her skirts and tried to pull her back away from the exit so that she then like kicked her essentially and managed to start getting away. But while she's getting away, she went by Pa who was holding an axe. What? She sees the glint as she's like running by trying to get out of this cabin. And this old man, because like if he was 60 in frontier years, that's a million was holding this gigantic axe. So she's freaking out and she just saw the metal glint and she runs out into the night. And she's at first thinking like, maybe I can steal a horse or something because they're miles away from anything. Yeah. But then she sees that John has a gun and he is getting ready to shoot it. So she literally like runs as far as she can and then finds this long grass and goes down in it because then he's shooting at her. So she laid in this grass for a really long time, and she said that she could hear the family talking in this mishmash of mostly German, but a little English, and they're cursing, and they're yelling at each other, and I guess Kate was laughing, and John's trying to find her, to shoot her, and Kate's holding a lantern up to like so that they could see where she went. And she said that as Kate and John got closer to her in the tall grass, she freaked out, and she was like, I'm just making a run for it. 
And so she made a run for it and she ended up having to walk slash run miles, miles until the sun came up. And she- But it doesn't matter at that point. You're like, fuck it. Yeah. She's like, I'm alive until she found another cabin. But I don't know what happened to this account if she just told it later or if she told people but they like didn't care or didn't believe her. So what did they want is the thing from her because she didn't have any money. I don't know. I mean, I think they probably just wanted to murder a pretty lady. Yeah. This is what we're going to talk about as this goes on because a lot of the killings are very obviously financially motivated. Which makes sense. Yep. They just, they want money. It's hard living out there on the frontier. But then on the other hand, there's a lot of situations where the people they murder are basically penniless. So you have to think that this is some sort of thrill kill for them. Yep. In October of 1872, two boys who were brothers were going fishing to prep for the long winter ahead. They were basically going to fish and then salt or smoke the fish to keep it for the winter. When they made a gruesome discovery, they found a bloodied and torn woman's dress in the creek. And then they followed the creek along further and found a bloated and battered man's corpse. Huh. The sheriff and coroner were alerted and they discovered that the unknown man had been robbed and brutally murdered. He had been first smashed so hard in the side of the head with something that his brain matter was visible. Then, as though to finish the job, the killer or killers had then deeply slit the man's throat, leaving a gaping wound and near decapitation. Was that, like, necessary? It seems like it was just to make sure that the man was truly deceased. The coroner estimated that the man had been in the water for six days before the little boys discovered him. So the Kansas Democrat and some other local papers ran descriptions of the man as the coroner assumed he had been in life and eventually attracted the attention of a devastated, now widow, named Martha Jones. Her husband had been passing through Osage Township to pay the last remaining $250 he owed on his farm loan, which is more like $2,500 today. He had never reached the loan office, so not only had he been robbed and murdered, Martha now was staring down a long, cold winter with three kids, no provider, and $2,500 in debt she had no way to pay. Ugh. Well, Martha could at least lay her husband, William Jones, to rest. Many of the women in her situation were left with absolutely no answers, not sure if their husbands were dead or had just abandoned them. So these men include the following. James Farik, a railroad worker who was traveling to stake a claim while his wife and baby son traveled to New York to visit family. In December of 1871. Then Henry McKenzie, a Civil War hero from Indiana, traveling to Independence to visit his sister for the holidays. Henry had been warned. I think he was traveling in the December of 1872, actually, so like a year later. So all of these are varied years because obviously later on when they are trying to put things together, some of the dates were imprecise, to say the least. Totally. So at this point, there was already a reputation when Henry McKenzie is traveling that this is a bad area. But he was like a legit Civil War hero, had survived a prison camp situation, who had saved many men's lives. He's not afraid of anything. So he was kind of like laughing at everyone. He's like, I've got this. I'm fine. I'm hearty and hale and I can handle what is thrown at me. But he too fell to the benders. Benjamin Brown was attempting to secure a loan for his family. His wife was pregnant with their third child, and he wanted to purchase a claim closer to his town for his growing family, just to make it easier on his wife. So he disappeared, and his wife, Mary, rode by stagecoach all the way down and up the trail, but no one had seen him. After hitting dead end after dead end, she had to return to her children, of course, but not before staying one night with the Benders. So she would later have to live with the knowledge that her dead husband had likely been only feet away from her when she spent the night Mm -hmm. with the killers that murdered him. Yeah, it's creepy. William McGrady, an Irish veteran of the Civil War, disappeared on his way to a land office to verify a claim. He was given 25 cents in Lador and told to get dinner at the Bender cabin by someone. He was never seen again. Beyond the missing men who would later be verified, there are still unknown travelers who almost certainly fell prey to the Benders as well. 
Body parts were found in ditches and creek beds. It would seem when the ground was too hard to dig, they would just dump these body parts anywhere. One young man named John Phipps was identified. His corpse had been ravaged by wild hogs. But the telltale injuries of a hammer to the head and a knife to the throat were still able to be identified. This was an M.O. John's father later said that he had been carrying $300 on his person, which I think is more like $3,000 in our money today. And the father supposed that he had been murdered for it. Obviously, now, citizens of Osage Township were getting worried. But this was a very complicated criminal issue to solve because there were some body parts. There was now at least two bodies in a handful of years, maybe like a year and a half at this point. But a lot of people did just disappear in the frontier. Yeah. And a lot of times people would seemingly have disappeared or been hurt and then they'd pop up in another state with a new family. Yeah. Yeah. So the authorities couldn't say for sure when these women were looking for their husbands that foul play had actually happened. Yeah, no. It's not like they have find my friends. Exactly. There's just no way to find somebody when they go off in a wagon, they can go anywhere and you have no way of finding them. So they still did issue a warning. There was a lot of criminal activity. And of course, there was like a lot of other criminal activity, like people were getting robbed and mugged and there was danger on the trail, obviously. And they were saying maybe you should avoid this section of the Osage Trail for a little while. But it was really hard because at that point, it was a pretty common artery to get to other places in the Midwest. And so people were like, hey, look, it's like Christmas. It's the holidays. I'm moving, whatever it was. Or, you know, I'm just like a guy going to the loan office. I'm going to use the most direct path. I'm not going to add a day, two days to my travel just because I'm a little scared. So it seems like there was no shortage of business ending up at the Bender cabin. Now, here's one of the victims that actually breaks my heart. George Longcore's time on the frontier had been filled with tragedy. He, too, was a Civil War veteran who had fought with the Union Army, and he had established a claim with his wife, Mary Jane, and baby son in 1870. The family was happy. Suzanne Jonas describes, like, the plants they were planting and the flowers and how they were excited to grow their family in this place when their baby boy grew sick with what turned out to be tuberculosis. Mm, The old TB. Yeah, they called it the lung disease. And back in the day, they were just like, sorry, he's a goner. Yeah. Take your baby home and try to make him as comfortable until he dies. The mortality rate for kids was that one in five babies died before they turned one on the frontier. One in five died before they even turned one. I mean, think about like the sanitation and stuff, though. It doesn't shock me. No. So the couple found solace in the fact that Mary Jane was pregnant again very soon after, and she delivered a healthy baby girl in January of 1871. Also, labor was so much more dangerous, too. So it's like every time you're having a baby, it's risky for the mom as well. Absolutely. And Mary Jane died one week after she had. Okay. Well, that's an excellent point, Andrea. (laughs) And to get to the next bit of the story... Mary Jane died one week after delivering baby Marianne. Man. So think about this poor guy, George Longcore. He's seen atrocities in the Civil War. He has fought on the side of justice. He finally established this little claim with his sweet little family. And now his wife is dead. His son is dead. He's left with a newborn baby that he is terrified of taking care of on the frontier all alone. It's like everything is going wrong. This guy has nothing. So he is completely heartbroken. And a couple months after Mary Jane died, he decided he wanted to leave his claim. He didn't know what he wanted to do. And so he traveled for, it sounds like, a couple hours in some direction. And he heard the sound of children playing and laughing and having a good time. And he came up to a homestead, which turned out to be the homestead of Dr. William York another veteran of the war and father of three children. Dr. York and his wife, Mary, lots of Marys back in the day. That was the name. Yeah. 
That's why they're like Mary Jane, Mary Ann, Mary Jo, Mary Ellen. <laughs> so many Marys. So they took the long course in and they helped George rebuild his life because he was a blacksmith by trade. And Mary, William's wife, helped take care of baby Marianne. So this was a pretty happy period for the Long Cours and for the York family. But after a little while, both George and his late wife's family came from Iowa. And both his parents and his in-laws desperately wanted him to come back. They hadn't even met their granddaughter at that point. So it's like, these are people aren't your kin. Come home and be with us in Iowa. Like, there's nothing really holding you there anymore. And he decided that that was a good idea, especially because William's wife, Mary, was pregnant with her fourth child. And she was at her limit with helping to take care of kids. And we know from this age, at this point, Mary Jane was 18 months old. And that's when they're really mobile, especially on the frontier. Think about all the shit they can get into. No, I would not have done well. No, (laughs) you would have been a mess. (laughs) But yeah, so he decides to move back to Iowa. And William's like, it's a little late in the season because they're not getting a move on until December. But I guess he, they didn't have super far to travel at that point. I don't know where Iowa to Kansas is. It's not far. I think a state over, two states over. So he said, you need a really good wagon and a set of horses. And I will sell you mine at a discount, essentially. So he gave him a really good price on this wagon and this team of horses. And off they went to Iowa. The long course set off in December of 1872 to be reunited with their family before Christmas. But instead, they would never be seen alive again. I figured. In late January of 1873, Dr. William York began to get letters from George's family saying that he had never made it to Iowa. William had already harbored his own fears after not receiving word from George upon his arrival in Iowa, which he was supposed to send a letter. William made some inquiries and discovered that George and baby Marianne were not the first to go missing on the Osage Trail. He decided to go visit his brother, former Senator Alexander York, and his father in Fort Scott to discuss the growing crime problem in Kansas. Prior to his departure, William discovered that a wagon meeting the description of his own, the one he had sold to George, had been found in a nearby town with clothing belong to a baby girl and a grown man. Terrifying. So he was pretty sure that it was theirs. William was heartsick and infuriated. When he saw his father and brother in March, he told them that he planned to hunt down the killer or killers of his dear friend and innocent child. So as you know from the beginning of this podcast, brave Dr. William York, who, by the way, had learned medicine and become a doctor while attempting to heal others in a Confederate prison camp, who was the father of three going on four children, did find the killers of the long cores, only he did not survive to bring them to justice. So crazy. So Alexander made the trip. He met the Benders, as I described at the beginning of the episode, but he was not convinced that they were murderers. He was a worldly man. He's also a political man. Yep. And he considered them eccentric and probably two-bit con people, but he did not want to strike up a mob mentality, and he was worried that if he outright accused them of anything— there would be a vigilante mob formed because people in this area were so desperate to find the perpetrators of the crime that he knew very quickly that this family would end up being lynched. And maybe they were just shady. Maybe they weren't actually killers. So he wasn't going to try to stir that up at this point. He instead arranged to bring up the issue of the missing travelers at an upcoming local election when the entire area was all in a town hall, proposing that there be a search of every cabin in the area to see if there was any evidence of the belongings of the missing, if anyone was harboring kidnapped people in some capacity. In the meantime, he also gained permission from the governor to declare that the state would pay $500 per head, which is more like $5,000, for any information that led to the apprehension of the criminals that were involved in these disappearances. 
And this was the absolute highest reward that Kansas State could legally give at this point. So this is red alert, FBI's most wanted list at this point. Yeah. However, when the day of this election came, one family was conspicuously absent from the meeting. After a neighbor discovered that the Benders had abandoned their homestead, leaving their livestock to starve, a posse was formed to search their cabin. On Monday, May 5th, 1873, the men rode out. Included in the group was the youngest York brother, Ed. So there had been three of them. Those in the group who were Civil War veterans immediately recognized a horrible and all too familiar smell as they approached the cabin. It only worsened as they stepped inside. It grew stronger yet as the man approached the back of the cabin and threw open the oily, stained canvas. At that point, one of the men saw that there was like a leather strap underneath the straw mattress and moved it aside to reveal a trap door. They're sleeping on top of all the bodies? Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. Disgusting. Upon throwing open the door, they were flooded with the overwhelming odor of death and decomposition. One brave man slowly lowered himself into the cellar. And while there was lots of evidence of blood, there was no sign of any dead body. Huh. Now, in some retellings of this, I have heard people say they opened up the trap door and there's just like this pile of corpses. All these corpses, just one on top of the other. At least from my understanding and from Suzanne Jonas's incredible research, that was not the case. In fact, they were completely bedeviled about why there wasn't a pile of corpses because it certainly smelled like there should be. But there was a slab. There was like a concrete slab. like I don't think it was concrete because I don't even know if they used concrete this way, but some sort of like hard slab on top. Okay. And they realized very quickly that there was probably likely something underneath that slab. So they were going to have to get tools and excavate this. They were also going to have to look around the grounds, too, and see if anyone was buried outside. The one thing they knew for sure was that dead bodies were on this homestead somewhere. Also, the same guy who had gone down in the cellar started looking around the cabin, and it looked like they had taken anything of value that they could that was easily carried. But they had to leave some things, like a lot of the furniture they couldn't move or take on their backs with them. And the stove was still there. So he was looking around the stove and hidden in the stove, he found three hammers of different sizes. One was a three-inch claw hammer. A second was a middle size hammer with a elongated head. And then there was a homemade sledgehammer. Sledgehammer. Think about this. Five and a half pounds. That's how much the sledgehammer weighed. Was it made of? You said like rock? I don't know. It said it was homemade. Yeah. It had to be like rock tied on a stick, right? Yeah. And I'm wondering whether Julia saw the sledgehammer and just thought it was an axe because she was running out of the cabin. Yeah, totally. Or he had an axe. I mean, I I wouldn't doubt. Homesteaders need axes, so he probably had an axe as well. So they have what they believe now are the murder weapons. Obviously, given the corpses they found so far, all had crushed in skulls. It would seem that the sledgehammer was one of the murder weapons, at least. So the team began to excavate the basement which, like I said, had blood all over it. But at that point, they could not tell whether it was animal or human blood. But like, why in the basement? Like, why would there be animal blood in the basement? That would be strange, for sure. They could be like stringing the animals up after killing them to drain them of blood in the basement for some reason. I can't even imagine what a basement looks like in front. Like, is it literally like a hole under the floor? Yeah, it would be like a packed earthen hole. It doesn't really seem like it would like dry the animal out like down there. Yeah. I mean, I think that they're trying to rationalize, be (laughs) rational about this whole thing, but obviously there's something dead in this space. And like Kansas, the Midwest is like real humid and shit. It's got to be gross. I mean, by the time they're digging in this hole, it's May. Oh, so it's getting hot. It's tornado season. Ed York was among the men in the basement. And when they got about four feet down after they broke the slab and started digging, They encountered their first body, and he was there to witness it. It was his brother, 
Dr. William York. William was wearing just his undershirt and he bore the telltale signs of a bender murder. His skull had been crushed in on the right side and there was a gaping laceration across his neck exactly like that of William Jones. Soon, Henry McKenzie, the proud veteran who had been unafraid, was also uncovered and he had a pile of defensive wounds all over his hands and up down his arms. So it appeared that he had fought like hell to the very end. There was also bullet holes on the opposite side of the cabin where somebody would have sat in the guest spot. And it looks like maybe some of the other victims had tried to get a couple shots off and unfortunately failed. William McCrotty was found next, and he is one of the people that had no money to his name. He was even loaned that 25 cents to get supper. So he was one of the people that made them think that there was more to this than just money. And of course, at this time, the term serial killer was not coined. It wasn't known. There was no real conception of people killing for anything other than love or money. So this was very confusing to them why they had killed some people that had nothing to get nothing just to kill. The coroner managed to piece together a theory of how the benders worked. Kate would be the lure and she would insist on their guests sitting with their back to the curtain. When they had relaxed, another family member, likely Pa or John, would then beat them in the temple with a crushing blow of a hammer. Now, some of the victims that they found, there was evidence of two hammers. So maybe on either side or it was two people doing the same thing. They believed that it was intended to stun the victim first so that they'd be incapacitated enough that someone, very possibly one of the women, would then get on top of them and slit their throat. Wow. To ensure that they were dead. Okay. Then they would almost immediately drop them down the trap door and have them bleed out in the basement. Now, this would happen very quickly. So if people were stopping by to call to pick up some grocery or stay the night, they could have this done in a matter of seconds. It's literally like pull the curtain over their head or come out from behind the curtain, slit their throat, lift it, and the blood's on the bender side now. It's behind the curtain. They clean that up, and then they don't have to worry about it at all until the coast is clear. And then when the coast would be clear, they would then strip the man down of all of his clothes, anything he was carrying on his body, and bury him or take him out and bury him somewhere else on the property. There was also evidence, and they would later catch some of these guys, that they were working with another criminal group that operated in the next town over the next area. And they would essentially fence the horses and the wagons and the goods that had anything that was identifiable on them to this group of thieves. Okay. So there was a whole network. There was a network of people that did know what the benders were up to, but it it didn't sound like they maybe knew exactly, but they knew. It was like an ask no questions thing. It's like, where are you getting all these people's horses and wagons, dude? If you're a criminal, you know when you see one. Exactly. More bodies were uncovered in the orchard, including those of Benjamin Brown. And very sadly, George Lancour and his 18-month-old baby, Mary Ann. George's throat had been cut so deeply that he was almost decapitated. And under the legs of his corpse, they found the little baby still wearing her dress and her mittens. Ew, what is wrong with them? Now, there was no sign of violence anywhere on little Marianne's 18-month-old body, which led the doctor at the time and I think since historians to believe they might have thrown her in the pit with him and she was buried alive. Ugh, God. But I I don't think that's the case. This is just me. This is coming in me, no forensic experience because I'm just thinking about these people's personalities and having done that, first of all, I feel like there would have been a lot more damage to the child's body as it fought to live because they said that she looked perfect otherwise. 
I also do not think that these are people like I don't think that they're kind like I don't think they would have done this out of the kindness of the sh- their heart but they wouldn't have wanted anyone potentially alerted and the sound of somebody being buried alive a toddler would certainly be loud my feeling is that smothering doesn't show any damage and maybe I'm just hoping this is the case but I think they would have smothered her with a pillow or something and put her in the hole first and then her father yeah that just makes more sense to me but I might also just not wanting to think about an 18-month-old child being buried alive. These people are horrifying. Horrifying. Absolutely no sense of humanity whatsoever, obviously. So the body of James Farik was also found, but it would take him more than a year to be positively identified. All in all, 11 souls were able to be identified, while other body parts in the stinking burial ground led the authorities to believe that there may have been up to 20 victims total. Whoa. This was ghoulish front page news across the country, especially because the notorious bloody benders were on the lam. They had hurriedly packed up all of their belongings on the very night that Alexander York had paid a visit to their cabin. They took the 9.03 p.m. train to Humboldt, a station that had connecting trails to Texas and Missouri. It is believed at Humboldt, the family split up with Ma and Pa going to Missouri and Kate and John going down to Texas. And it seemed likely that Kate and John were planning to get to an outlaw community that was on the Texas-Mexico border area. But what truly happened to the Benders, we will never know for sure. Ugh. We will never know, Andy. I have a theory. Don't worry. I'm going to tell you my theory, okay? Suzanne Jonasis did a formidable job tracking down the efforts of various lawmen and recording sightings. It's like a good hundred pages of people who were hot on their trail, who saw them. There was one outlaw who ran with them for a little while, especially um, Kate and John. There was a lot of accounts, but they all came to... Nothing in the end. There's just so much hysteria and misinformation, false sightings. And there was even like idiots looking for attention that were pretending to be the benders until they got thrown in jail. And then they were like, I was just trying to get attention. Oh, my God. Boy who cried wolf. Yeah. I mean, that has been going on since the beginning of time. So like we crazy. think like people are obnoxious on social media or, you know, something like uh, the woman up in California who I can't remember her name at this point, but who said she was abducted by Hispanic women. Remember that? Yes. Yeah. People have been looking for attention. People have been lying. People have been doing shit like this since the beginning of time. So it's really hard when, you know, you're 150 years later to all of a sudden be able to track down exactly what happened when you're reading newspaper reports and you don't know what's fact and what's fiction. Of course. So despite an extraordinary amount of bounty offered, it was $75,000 in rewards offered in today's money between the state of Kansas and Alexander York himself. Apparently, Alexander York was very sick with guilt about not apprehending the benders when he had the chance. Yeah, but if that was his strategy, that was his strategy. It did seem very political and by the book. It was very political and by the book. In October of 1889, a mother and daughter named Elmira Monroe and Sarah Eliza Davis were arrested on suspicion of being Ma and Kate Bender, allegedly due to a strong likeness between both women and the criminals and that one of the victim's daughters had actually had a conversation with this Sarah Eliza Davis about a dream she had of her father being killed. And she said, oh, no, that really happened. That dream is real. You were there. I know because my mother is Ma Bender. So that woman, of course, brought her to the authorities. And this Sarah Eliza Davis said that she wasn't Kate, but her mother was Ma Bender, which her mom is going absolutely not. She claimed that Kate was her sister. So she was another child of Ma Bender's. So the women were thieves, and apparently the mother had been in jail previously for manslaughter. So there was a lot of signs that were pointing to these people as at least criminals. So they were arrested for larceny, 
But later those charges were dropped and then they were charged with murder based on the fact that they were believed to be Ma and Kate Bender. However, when you really dug into it, it didn't make any sense. It was like there was witnesses that were like, no, I've met them. That's not them. They do look alike, but it's certainly not them. And then there was some time frame issue that proved that the mother, Elmira, could not actually be Ma Bender. Yeah, but it sounds just like Elvira. Elmira and Elvira, yep. <laughs> but they said that at the end of the day, it did not seem likely. And historians do not believe that they were truly Ma and Kate or even Ma and her other daughter, Sarah. Okay. So they were definitely liars and criminals, but it's very skeptical that they were actually the Benders. Alexander York, who had sworn to avenge his brother's death, was conspicuously absent for these legal proceedings when they were putting Sarah and Elmira on trial hmm. for being the so-called Bender women. So people took that to mean that the York family did not believe that these women were the Benders. Many believe that's because Alexander and his brother Ed had formed a vigilante mob, hunted down the Benders, and killed them themselves allegedly by hanging. So they said that actually, like, people believe that Ma, Pa, and John had been hung and Kate had been burned alive. Now, this is my favorite theory personally. So this is, like, it's not my theory, but it's my favorite theory because I think it fits with their personality types. We know that the Yorks are persistent, righteous, and they have dogged personalities and given that Alexander had barely recovered from one political scandal, he basically, to just sum up his scandal, he had taken bribe money from another governor to not run to prove that the guy was bribing people. But when he did that and he like went before Congress with all this bribe money and he's like, look, look, he's bribing people. He bribed me. They were like, yeah, but you took the money. <laughs> And he's like, but I'm giving it to you for proof. And they're like, ew, but why were you even bribed to begin with, dude? <laughs> That's dirty money. Get that away from me. That's dirty money. And you still took the bribe. So I don't know. I don't know about all this. So he had just tried to do that. And he had served as a senator for a while, but then failed because of this scandal. And he had tried to do everything by the book before. And it had failed. Some part of me was like, I can see him being like, I have the money. I have the men. I can hire some people that will be hush-hush. We go do this ourselves. I know that I've got justice. We don't tell anyone because I'm not getting more shit coming down my way because of scandal. And that the fact that he didn't, he had no interest in this trial because he knew that they were already dead. I feel like if he didn't already know they were dead, he would have been there trying to see if it was them. Exactly. He also offered up a whole lot of money. <laughs> he offered up like, I don't know, the equivalent of like $10,000 or more for their reward. I'm like, maybe he offered up that money because he knew he'd never have to pay it. <laughs> He's like, yes, a million buccarinis for you because they're already dead. <laughs> well, if he did, he took it to his grave in February of 1928. Newspaper articles of the time declared that with his death, the secret of what truly happened to the Benders was sealed. His legacy included his part in the Bender investigation, the political takedown of his corrupt counterpart, Senator Samuel Pomeroy, and the installation of Senator John Ingalls, who served 18 legendary years in Kansas and was a distant cousin of Laura Ingalls Wilder, the author, of course, of Little House on the Prairie. Wow. Speaking of Little House on the Prairie, Laura Ingalls Wilder did claim a connection to the Benders at a Detroit book fair in 1937. She said about stopping at their cabin when she was a little girl. We stopped there on our way to the little house while Pa watered the horses and brought us all a drink from the well near the door of the house. I saw Kate Bender standing in the doorway. We did not go in because we could not afford to stop at a tavern. Wilder went on to describe how the search for the Benders went on for many years, but her father was never interested in reports that they had been apprehended. Instead, he told his daughter that the family would never be found. She basically hinted that her father had been part of the vigilante mob that had killed the Bender family. So cool. <laughs> now, this would be really, really cool 
if it was true. Oh. I know. Apparently, the years that they were in the Little House of the Prairie or lived near the Benders don't actually add up to the years that the Benders were in Kansas. So is this just part of her story? Yeah, well, apparently her daughter, Rose, was... Everyone has always been obsessed with the Benders. I mean, they still are to this day. The author was talking about how she was like... She went to an axe-throwing bar and everyone's like, oh, given all their theories, like it's a big true crime conversation. And it was back in the 30s, too. People were not over it. And so her daughter, Rose, was like looking for press, essentially, and said, Mom, you should write a whole thing about how my grandfather was part of like the mob that brought down the benders. And she's like, well, yeah, that's not true. So she refused to write it down because she was like, she didn't want to stretch the truth that much. And also she wrote children's literature. She's like, this has no place in children's literature. But she did make that speech at that Detroit book fair. So obviously she wanted to like tease just a little bit of it, maybe for a little press, that there was some connection. But historians do not believe that it was ever true, unfortunately. But I do have one Wikipedia fun fact, Andy. Wikipedia fun fact. (laughs) It's actually kind of like horrorboard.net fun fact. (laughs) Horrorboard.funnet. Yes. Rob Zombie based the psycho killer family from his movie House of 1000 Corpses on the Bloody Benders. I think I knew that. (laughs) I've never seen it because that's too gory for me. Yeah. But I I think they're the Firefly family. It's just, it's the way that he shoots it looks like horrifying, but it's a lot of a spectacle. I really like Rob Zombie's music, I have to say. It's a surprising fun fact about Jesse. Like, I really do. Surprising fun fact about Jesse. <laughs> I do. It, does, it doesn't seem like he'd, he'd be my flavor, but I really do love Rob Zombie. He's talented. Yes. Okay, so that's it. I mean, this was one that I have been percolating on for a very long time. And then when Susan Genesis released her book, I was like, it's time. I know it might not be a love murder fit, but it's time. I gotta I gotta get to the bottom of this for myself. Yeah, you need some closure on knowing everything. I needed closure on the bloody vendors and I feel like this was a therapy lesson. So thank you all for coming to my frontier therapy today. In conclusion, I know there wasn't a frontier Yelp, but I probably would have passed on an eating establishment that was filled with corpse flies and had an oily stained curtain as a wall. Yeah, and also a curtain is never a wall. You can't ever trust a curtain. Like you don't lean up against a curtain. No, (laughs) absolutely not. And as always, trust your gut when it comes to the frontier so no one gets their head bashed in with a homemade hammer all right that's the show bye (laughs) bye love you guys